with a description of the agony of o Chicago's O'Hare Airport, <laughs> uh, unredeemed. I mean, you know, every, every awful lineup, question, stupid individual, bureaucratic snafu you can think of. That simple opening leads to this, you know, and you think, how on earth could they snatch a kid in broad daylight from, you know, the middle of O'Hare? Well, of course, the easiest place in the world to snatch a child would probably be the middle of O'Hare. Because although an airport is supposed to be one of the most secure places on the oh. planet, the focus is unidirectional. All they're looking for is terrorists. They're so focused on the terrorist, the, the, the suicide bomber. As soon as someone has set off the alarm, that's the focus of their attention. And you know, you could, you could have like a, a, a troop of singing and dancing girls running off with a small child and they wouldn't <laughs> notice. But, it, but, but it's, it's a great opening because it really is the ordinary leading into the frightening and then leading into, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the terrible history of how this child ended up in this airport, which is uh, the two women. And beyond that, we're not going to go, because I don't want to deprive anybody of a really great story. And you won't guess the ending, I promise you. Not on this one. I, th I figured it out three different times. I was wrong all three times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, because you know, the, the amount of mysteries you read that makes you one of the very sophisticated I, readers. I, I can... And the, the challenge for writers like me these still days... Still be bamboozled by you. Go oh, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> but the, but the, the great challenge for us as crime writers, I think, these days is like, you know, this is a room full of people who read crime fiction, and I suspect that most of you read at least a book a week. Many of you read more than a book a week. Some of you probably read a book a day on good weeks. Um, and the, the thing is, if you read enough good crime fiction over the years, you start to get a sense of how we put stories together. And you start to think by page 20, I've got a feeling where this might be going. Now, my job is to make you come along on the journey. Even when you think you know where I'm going, it's my job to make you care enough to come with me. So that even if you were right on page 20, at the end you still go, that was a good read. Mm. And that's the challenge for crime writers. You've got, to, you've got to not just do the twist at the end, not just do the whodunit, pardon me. You've actually got to make it worth someone's time. You know, I'm asking you to give up hours of your time. The least I can do is try and make it worth your while. Well, this one, I guarantee you, is worth the while. I was going to ask you uh, uh, as well, the, uh, um, one of the things that all readers know about when we love a series there's that time when the series characters begin to get, shall we say, a little predictable or even weak. And this doesn't happen with your character. How, you, how do you manage to keep characters like uh, uh, Tony Hill and Carol Jordan fresh for us? What do you do? Is there something you do that other writers don't do? Or is it something that you build into the character itself? Well, one of the things I think that, that for me is important is that I don't write two novels back to back with the same characters. I've got a very low boredom threshold. So when, I, when I first quit the day job and started writing full time, I wrote two Kate Brannigan novels back to back, and by halfway through the second one, I was like, I hate this bitch. <laughs> I am so over her. And it wasn't, that, it wasn't really that I was so over her, it was just that I was bored because I'd been like hanging out with her for too long. <laughs> um, and you know, this happens to all of us, you know, even I can be boring, ask my wife. Um, <laughs> so I, I realised that the issue for me was, was that I, I couldn't write books back to back with the same character, that I had to alternate um, either characters in series or standalones, but I couldn't do it. And so... That's what I've started doing, really. I, 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 at the moment, I'm writing a, a Tony Hill, Carol Jordan, then a standalone. And That's so, the next one, for those of you who were hoping. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I come back to Tony and Carol, I'm excited. It's fresh. I've not had them in my head, or not had them at the front of my head for a while. Um, and it's, it's, it's like when you see friends when you haven't seen them for a while. What have you been up to? What have you been doing while I wasn't looking? Um, and, and I think also it's because I don't have an overarching... Tony and Carol arc. I've not got like, you know, 10 novels planned or anything like that. Every book I write, I write book to book with those characters. And when the point comes where I have nothing more to say with those characters, um, or where they're not 
shouting in my head and clamouring to be heard. I will step away from them. I've done it before. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not frightened to do it again. I think I have enough resources within my, my, my imagination to do that and still to have a career that people will, will want to follow, that books I'll want, they'll want to read. I don't have any desire to say goodbye to them at the moment because I think there are still lots of potential in those characters, both in, the, both in terms of their personal relationship and in terms of the job that they're capable of doing. Um, I did give myself some quite substantial problems at the end of the retribution, <laughs> but that's part of the fun, isn't it? It's the challenge. I mean, the, f for me, the, one of the great joys of, of writing is that sense of challenge, that sense of pushing myself. You know, I don't just want to write the same book again and again. You know, I don't just want to write, sit there and say, oh, well, it's the start of the writing year. What shall we do with Inspector Grumpy this time? <laughs> but that's not my ambition for, for my writing career. Um, so for as long as those two interest me, I'll keep on going with them. And when they don't interest me anymore, I'll send them skipping off into the sunset together. So, you, so, so, so when, we, when, we, when we see the coming together of Carol and Tony, that's the beginning of the end. Eh? That is the end of the end. That's, yeah, that's the, the end, end of the end. end. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about it is if, they, if those two were, you know, actually, actually managed to get together their relationship, they couldn't work together. Well, that's the true. two of them, would, they'd, they'd both have that sort of, no, I can't do this. Well, I want to ask about uh, one, of, one of your favorite, one of my favorites of your characters is the, uh, uh, the, the, the disgraced psychiatrist, uh, Sh Charlie Flint, who oh. makes just a little tiny appearance in here. Does that mean that maybe Charlie's going to come back one day, I hope? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard because I mean, Charlie Flint is the central character in Trick of the Dark, mm -hmm. and, and she is a disgraced um, psychiatrist. But see, part of the problem with bringing Charlie Flint back is a lot of the reason why Charlie is interesting is because her relationship's under pressure. She's a woman who's behaving badly, or would like to be behaving badly. Um, she has, in a, in a way, she, this, the story that, that she, she ends up being at the heart of is a story that draws on her own history. I'm not sure how interesting Charlie Flint would be if she's happily married to Maria and doing the things that, whatever it is that dentists like to do on a weekend. You know. <laughs> Um, not that I have anything against dentists, don't get me wrong. Lovely, <laughs> lovely wonderful people, dentists. Um, I'm, not, I'm just not sure how interesting Charlie Flint would be. I mean, she's, she's been exonerated. She's back doing her job again. I'm not sure how interesting she'd be. I, I just I'm open to persuasion, but... I'm, I, be, I, I think there's more there than you think. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, with Charlie Flint, you were one of the first writers to bring uh, uh, lesbians into storylines. And I, I gather from uh, um, your excellent, by the way, website, that um, someone actually, a publisher actually said to you that, you know, this was, this was death. That was about 10 years ago. And they said- <laughs> Times have changed, yeah, thank when God. I, when I floated the idea of, of, um, of uh, the trick, trick of the dark, first, I, I, I was told that this would be commercial suicide. But thankfully, times have changed. Um, but also, I think um, it's, it's one of those things you know, like I've you know, I've made my bones, as it were. Um, and and because my, my my German publisher, I remember being confronted with with Trick of the Dark, and he was slightly anxious and saying, "Well, it's it's just a little worrying for us because here in Germany we are quite conservative." Um, <laughs> I and, wonder if and, he's ever been to Berlin. <laughs> Uh, and he's like, you know, so I, I, I'm not sure how we will market this book. And my editor just turned to him and said, it's clear, Hans-Peter, we will market it as the new Val McDermott. <laughs> and, and, you know, so in, in a way, you know, so it's, it's exactly, as I said, you know, like the, 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 the success with readers of the previous books means that, that, that a publisher can now take a risk on a book, if you like, that, that 10 years ago would have been a much bigger risk. And I think it's quite interesting um, if you look at the Amazon ratings for my books. They go like, you know, four, 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 one and a half, four, <laughs> four, four, four. And the one and a half is Trick of the Dark, which is chock full of lesbians. And there, there's a shitload of one star reviews for that book from people who clearly have not read this book or read any of the rest of my work. And that, I don't know if it's, I don't know how organized it is, but there is clearly some, you oh, know, there's, there's fundamentalist this. Christian 
um, thing. I mean, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's funny at one level, but another level, it's really not funny. Um, that actually has almost like the equivalent of a phone tree that goes, go and give this book a one-star review because it's full of lesbians. Um, oh, and, yeah. and that's, that's you know, I, I, I can't, I, I, I don't think I'm being paranoid about this. No. Um, because this is not, this is a book that, that was, you know, hugely praised by professional reviewers and by most readers, bloggers online. Um, but it is this interesting phenomenon that you and, you, and I'm not the only person who has suffered from this kind of thing. It's happened no. to other writers that I know, where if, where if you write a book that has gay or lesbian characters at the heart of the book, and suddenly you get all these one-star reviews. I've had, I've had people write, write in when I review books with, uh, 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 with gay themes or gay, gay characters. I've had people write in and say, these are dirty books. Why are you reviewing them? Yeah. And, you know, a book, good book is a good book. <laughs> well, yeah. If the, you know, if, if the Hell sex yeah. is good, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, I always say it's easier to do good sex than it is to write good sex. That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> That's really the truth. Speaking as one who's read a lot of bad sex. <laughs> and done Pots. a lot of good sex. Hmm? <laughs> Had some good stuff. I, I, at least I know the difference, which is... <laughs> <laughs> I know that I know that sex in Robert Ludlum and Tom Clancy has been supplanted by uh, 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 weapons readouts. Mm. Yeah, you get a schema of a gun instead of good sex. Yeah. Yeah. And well, for those of you who I've don't know, Robert things... Ludlum is dead. He's oh, dead. The yeah. stuff you're seeing out there with his name on it, he's dead. Not him. He's dead. He's dead. <laughs> Not him. He's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Finished. James, James Patterson is not actually dead yet, but, no, you know, but, but he might as well be for the amount of well input he has in his books. Out. Yeah, this, is, this brings us to the fact that you can turn out a book in, what did you say, four months? And, and, but I do one a year. But high quality. But, then, but, but, but have, he's turning out one every six months, and they're dogs. I mean, you uh, know. Like, she said that, not me. I said that. <laughs> you can um, take it to the bank. I... Having said that, you know, uh, just because a book takes me four months to write doesn't mean it takes me four months to create. No. Books can take years from that first idea. I mean, Trick of the Dark that we were talking about earlier there, I had the first idea for Trick of the Dark, and I knew the shape of the story and the shape of the plot and what was at the heart of the matter 12 years before I wrote the book. I could not find the structure. I could not find the way to tell the story. I wrote the first 10,000 words of that book about five times. And every time it was rubbish, it was wrong, the, it just wasn't working. And um, eventually what happened was that the world caught up with me. Because what I needed in that book is for one of the, the central characters to delve into her past and talk about her history. And there was no reason that I could think of for her to do this. It was, it was dead and buried, the past was gone. She didn't have, there was no, need, no reason why she should, should engage with it again. And I couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, and then eventually what happened was the rise of the misery memoir. You, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't walk into a library or a bookshop without tripping over a pile of them. Uh, and I suddenly, it suddenly dawned on me that that was the way to go. I could, I could have her write a misery memoir, which would open up her whole history to scrutiny. And that was the key. That was the key that gave me the structure to the book. So after 12 years, I finally had a way to tell this story. And sometimes you just have to be patient. So although, you know, in one sense, yes, I write a book a year, but that book will almost always have been a lot longer than a year in the making. Um, a Place of Execution, for example. The first idea I had for that book came in 1979 when I moved to the Peak District in Derbyshire. Oh. And I fell in love with the White Peak. And I knew that I wanted to write about that. And I knew I wanted to write about it in a particular kind of way. And it was 20 years before I actually managed to, to write the book. Um, so you just have to be patient sometimes with an idea. Let it come. Trust yourself. If an idea is good enough, if it's strong enough, you will eventually find the way to write it. If the idea is too weak, it'll just fade away and dribble off into the night. And, and that's fine. What made you decide to write a children's book? <laughs> Well, I didn't really decide. This is, again, it's another aspect of my accidental career. Um, I, I had my, it was at the time a few years ago when there were lots of celebs writing children's books. And my publisher said to me, oh, you must have a children's book in you. You must have a children's book. You have a child. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I kept saying, you know, no, I can't. No, I haven't. It's a specialized skill. I don't possess that skill. I'm not going to even attempt it. 
But eventually she just kept going on and on and on. And the only way I thought to shut her up was to send her something. So I sent her what in my head was pretty much a piece of doggerel that I had made up for my son when he was younger called My Granny is a Pirate. And it was one of those things like, you know how it's fun to tell lies to small children, you know. Um, I told him that my granny indeed was a pirate and my mother, God bless her, maintained this illusion for me, you know. She said, oh, it was awful hard having a mum that was a pirate. <laughs> Never knew what you were going to get for your tea. <laughs> um, you know, because I mean, it's, it's, it's fun, it is fun to tell lies to children, isn't it? I mean, for, for about six months, I, I had my son convinced that when I was his age, the world was grey. There was no colour. I <laughs> said, so, you know, when I was your age, my skin was grey. Everything was black and white. You see the photographs, they're black and white. You see the old films, they're black and white. <laughs> the old telly, they're black and white, you know. And, and uh, I said, like, you know, we didn't get colour till the 1960s, you know. <laughs> And my, and my wife, the American God bless her, clinched it by saying, yeah, we got it in America first. <laughs> and so about six months later, he came home from school one day and he said, you lied to me, mummy. <laughs> and I said, what about, darling? <laughs> Thinking, which lie is it? <laughs> and he said, about the colour. He said, you lied to me. And I said, well, it wasn't, wasn't so much a lie. It was more a sort of wind up, you know. <laughs> And he looked at me, he was about seven at the time, looked at me with these hurt eyes and said, how can I ever trust you again? <laughs> well, the answer is basically never, you know. <laughs> so I had, I had, I had, I had written this, this well, I'd, I'd made up really, I hadn't even written it down to begin with, this, this, this poem about my granny being a pirate. Uh, you know, my granny is a pirate, she sailed the seven seas, she's captured many pirate ships but was always home for tea. <laughs> And I sent this off to my publisher thinking at least she'll shut up and leave me alone now, but no, 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 no. She, she called me and I said, darling, we love it. We want to publish it, darling. And I'm like, oh, for Christ's sake. And she, she said, but darling, darling, children's picture books have to be 32 pages long, so we need another four verses. So I had to go and make up some more of this, this poem. Uh, and then they found me a wonderful illustrator, a guy called Arthur Robbins, who completely brought it to life. And I think a large part of the reason for the success of the book has been Arthur's illustrations, which are wonderful. So Granny is sort of short and, and, and rotund and ginger. She's got ginger curls uh, under her pirate hat, and she's got a pirate parrot. <laughs> and she's got a pirate dog called Jolly Roger, <laughs> who is a sort of Staffordshire bull terrier with one black eye. It's lovely. <laughs> And, and I discovered all these things about writing children's books that you'd never know. Like, you're not, for a, book, a picture book for small children, you're not allowed to use the words killed or dead. Because, of course, I mean, small children never play games where they go, you're dead, you're dead, do they? <laughs> so I had to make those slight alterations to it. And for my money, the best illustration that Arthur drew out of all of them, and, and, and they're fantastic illustrations, they just totally come alive, was Jolly Roger the dog peeing on a pirate's wooden leg. <laughs> and it is exactly, we're all laughing there. And we all know, don't we, that children have all, all the jokes of children under seven involve poo or wee. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but no, this was too vulgar, apparently. So oh, no. it doesn't actually appear in the final book. Uh, <laughs> but I have it framed on my bathroom wall. <laughs> So, so I, yeah, I did end up doing this, this kids' book, which um, has proved quite successful in the UK, and they would quite like some more. Well, now, if you want to get this, because it's not available here, you can get this through Val McDermott's own bookstore, and I want you to tell everybody how this works, Val. Well, I live in a small village in Northumberland in the northeast of England, um, and in our village we have a post office. And if you go to my website, you can find a page for signed books and you communicate with the Allenmouth Post Office and they will supply you with a signed and, if you like it, personally dedicated copy of the book at list price plus the cost of postage. And it will be sent to you anywhere you like in the world, dedicated to anybody you like it to be. And the, the, my books are the only books that are on sale in the post office. <laughs> um, it's just a little deal of mutual benefit, you know. <laughs> Post office makes some money out of it, and I sell some more books, and everybody's happy. Um, but sometimes tourists come into the, the village, of course, obviously not knowing that I live there, why would they? And they go into the, 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 the post office, because they've run out of things to read, and they say, is there anywhere I can get a book in the village? And everybody goes, oh yeah, we get one in the post office. <laughs> 
And they're like, there's shelves of Val McDermott books. And they go like, you've only got Val McDermott books. You know? <laughs> and, and, and Kat, the postmistress, goes, well, why would you need any others? <laughs> So if, if you ever have a hankering for, for my granny, or indeed for anything else, if you, if you require a, a signed and personalised book for perhaps a loved one's birthday or Christmas gift, and you don't happen to live... I mean, it's obviously you're all right tonight because you can stock up here. <laughs> um, but if, if at some point in the future, or if you've got friends who live out in the wastes of Saskatchewan or somewhere, <laughs> um, you know, or, or, or what's, what's that place way up in the north? Yellowknife. Yellowknife, yes. <laughs> People, if you've got friends in Yellowknife who need a signed book, tell them to go to the website and contact the Allenmouth Post Office. And the website, uh, the website is very simple, easy to remember. ValMcDermott.com. Even I could remember it. So, <laughs> so that's 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 what we do, because um, we understand that not everybody can can come along to an event, and some people like to have signed books.